I want you to think of a time when you were at rock bottom. And some are living that right now. The COVID virus has turned your life upside down. Financial problems from being out of work have created all kinds of other problems. There's issues with relationships. There's loss of loved ones. Some are battling sickness because you have had or have the virus. Some are struggling with addictions, loss of confidence, or even hope that things will get better. There's doubt and fear and worry and stress, and, and it's been going on for so long, it just seems like a normal part of life now. You don't know when the last time was that you had a good night's sleep and woke up refreshed. Others are riding this shut, shut down better. Their jobs are secure. They're still receiving a paycheck. They have things to do to keep busy, but there were times in their lives when they understood what it meant to be at the bottom. For some, it was their childhood, raised in a dysfunctional home. You had very little security. You had to learn to care for yourself because it didn't seem like anybody else cared. For others, it was as a teen that we struggled the most. The anger and the rebellion that we bottled up inside and then they came pouring out in rage just turned lives upside down. For others, it was addictions to alcohol, drugs, porn, anything. It led you down a dark path of destruction. And we hurt ourselves and hurt the ones that we loved through our actions. For others, it was loving someone who went down that path and trying to help them and watching them self-destruct in front of their eyes. Bad marriages and relationships can bring us to rock bottom. We feel alone and guilty. We lose hope of things ever getting even close to the dreams that we had when we were younger. Some faced rock bottom when a doctor gave them a diagnosis that brought some of the deepest fears they've ever faced. All of a sudden, their life was drastically changed forever. Whenever that time was at being at the bottom, or whatever brought it on, what was your response when it happened? How did you handle it? What did you do? In the third Psalm, David was at rock bottom. I want to encourage you to turn there so you can follow along as I read this in just a little bit. Psalm 3. David had sinned with Bathsheba. He had an affair with her, and she got pregnant. He had her husband murdered to try to cover his sin. Those actions caused some serious issues in David's family. And those issues were what brought David to this point. One of David's sons had raped one of his daughters. David didn't handle that well. And this girl's brother, Absalom, resented his father, David, for that. And as this psalm was written, Absalom had taken over David's kingdom. He had done that by force. He drove David out, out of the palace and into hiding. David was hiding for his life. He had defiled David's wives. The nation of Israel sided with Absalom against David. They said that God had left David because of David's sin. And David was doing his best to try to save his life. He was being hunted like an animal. And this psalm is his response as he is going through all of this. He responds differently from how we often respond when we are at the bottom. I encourage you to follow along as I read the third psalm. Oh Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you are a shield around me, O oh Lord. You bestow glory on me and lift up my head. To the Lord I cry aloud, and he answers me from his holy hill. I lie down and sleep. I wake up again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against me on every side. Arise, O Lord, deliver me, O my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw, break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. Oftentimes, when we've hit rock bottom, we don't respond as David responded. 
We worry. We get stressed out. Sometimes to the point where we make ourselves sick. Other times, in order to take our minds off of all of our problems, we just try to get busy with anything that we can do. Anything to help us not think about what's going on. Other times, we self-medicate to try to numb ourselves to, to all that's going on. And, and some of us handle those times by doing nothing and just wallowing in our misery. David did something very different. This psalm is a prayer. Many of the psalms are prayers. But this psalm was David's response to being at rock bottom. He cried out to God, even though he was all alone as he ran, trying to hide to keep from being killed. He knew that he had somebody to talk to. And he talked to God, honestly and openly. And he knew that God always listened. No matter what he had done in the past, even though he was a murderer and an adulterer and done terrible things, he had confessed those sins to God, he had turned from them, and he knew that God would listen. And that's what God does for every single one of us. Oftentimes, we downplay prayer. We say, well, prayer is what you do when you can't do anything about the problems, and, and the best thing to do is to be doing what we can do. David understood that prayer brought God into the problems. And God was bigger than he was. God could do things that he could never do. And for David, prayer wasn't something he did when he couldn't do something. Prayer was what he did. And when he was done praying, then he strove to do what he could in God's power to correct things. Sometimes we don't pray because we think prayer is only for other people. That we're not good enough. God won't listen. God doesn't care about us. We have to be like so and so for God to hear our prayers. Well, we see from David, that's not the case. The reason David was committed to prayer was because of his faith in God. We see in verses 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, this implication of David's faith. He believed, he trusted, not in himself, not in what he could do, not in others, not that the nation of Israel was going to take his side and, and turn things around. His trust was in God. And he trusted in God because he understood who God was. He understood God's nature. He understood his character. He had already seen God's strength and God's love for him in spite of what he had done. This trust, or this faith, was based on the relationship that he had with God. A relationship of a father to a son. And David could understand that because even though he had been an imperfect father... He still loved his son Absalom, even though he was running and hiding from him for fear of being killed. In the end, in verse 8, he asks God's blessing on everyone, including Absalom. He didn't want Absalom harmed. And if David understood, if he was an imperfect father and he cared that much for his child who was doing this to him, how much more did God care about him? And so David had confidence in the promises that God had made about David as a king. And he was convinced that God always would answer his prayer. Might not be in the timing that David hoped. Might not be the way David hoped. But he knew God would have an answer and that answer would be good because of God's character. And so David prayed. And for many respects, it doesn't seem like David did a lot. All he did was cry out to God and share what was on his heart with God. But as we look through this psalm, we see God doing a lot for David. In verse 3, David says he's a shield around him. God was his protector. And even at those times when it seemed like God wasn't doing as good a job as David would have liked him to do, David knew that God had been his protector in the past. Years before this, Saul had been out to kill him, and David was hiding from him for fear of being killed. God protected David then. David knew the story of Job from the Old Testament, and he knew that God protected 
Even with Job and the terrible things that were done to him, every time Satan came and said, this is what I want to do to Job, God said, you can only go this far. And he protected Job. In verse 3, David also says that God bestows glory on him. Now, glory is an attribute of God, but it's, it's an attribute of God that is oftentimes associated with kings. And usually when it was associated with kings, it was associated with them in terms of their army. The bigger their army, the more powerful their army, the more glory that king had. Now, here is David as a king with no army. His army was with Absalom. And yet... God used his army on behalf of David. God gave David glory. Not to build up David, encouraged him, but to show God's goodness. Verse 3, David says that God lifts up his head. He gives him confidence. He gives him encouragement. Now this isn't pride. It's not self-confidence. It's confidence in God. David is saying that he trusts God. He trusts God's plan through all of this. He trusts the purpose that God has for this. He trusts God's timing in this, all because that relationship with God was so deep and so strong. In verse 5, he says that God sustains him. That God is the one who gives him the strength to be able to continue in spite of how dark and how bad things were. And that word for sustain is a word that oftentimes is used for what we get from food. When we eat good food, we get the energy from that. We get the sustenance that we need to be able to, to do the work that we need to do. That sustaining that God gave him, David said, turned his despair to hope. What a tremendous change. In verses 7 and 8, David said that God delivers him. And he calls out for God to strike his enemies. He knows that God is going to give him victory and ultimately that God will vindicate him at the end. And that that will be done not to make David look good, but so that God looks good. David calls out on God to break the teeth of his enemies. It was a, a practice that was used at those days with wild animals. You would break their teeth so that they couldn't do any lasting damage if they attacked you. And that's what David is recognizing God is going to do for him. He's going to take the power of David's enemies away from them to hurt him. So they can't do lasting damage to him. And that's what God does for us often. Because of his power and his goodness as our father, he removes our enemy's power to inflict lasting damage. It may hurt for a while, but we have eternity ahead of us, and it won't hurt that long. Because of what God did through David's prayers. In verses 5 through 8, we see David's response to God. And David's response was a response of submission and humility. He recognized God's greatness and God's goodness and his need to just humble himself before God and follow God. He submitted to God and realized he needed to do things God's way and not his own way. And so David submitted to God's will. He submitted to God's plan. He submitted to what God wanted to do, the where that he was doing it, the how God was doing it, even though it didn't make sense to David at the time. He submitted to God's purpose, the why God was doing it. And he submitted to God's timing in all of this, the when God was going to do that. And part of submission is patience. And David demonstrates that in this, in this psalm. He waited for God to do what God was going to do. In verse 5, David says he could sleep. <laughs> when you're at the bottom... Oftentimes, the last thing that you can do is sleep. You're worried sick. Your mind's going 90 miles an hour at night. You can't shut it down. You toss and turn all night long. But David said in the middle of this, he could sleep. He could sleep because of his trust in God. This picture of him sleeping is showing that he was doing the opposite of what we normally do of worrying. 
His faith gave him the peace that he needed to be able to sleep at night. He said in verse 6, he had no fear of his enemies. He had no fear of the situation, no matter how bad they were, no matter how big, no matter how powerful. David knew his God was bigger and greater. Now, this wasn't David's feeling. This was a choice he made, a deliberate decision that he made. I'm sure he didn't feel this way all the time. And notice, David made this choice not to fear his enemies before God's action was completed. He's still in hiding. He's still running for his life. But he knew how great God was. And because of that, in verse 8, he sought the best for his enemies. May your blessing be on your people. That was God's blessing for his son Absalom, even though he had done so much against David. That was seeking God's blessing on the nation of Israel, even though they had deserted him. And it shows that David's response to God was also forgiveness of those who had harmed him because he recognized how much God had forgiven him for. And because God had forgiven him of so much, he was determined that he would forgive those who did against him. This psalm begins with people questioning God's deliverance. Verse 2, it says, Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But this psalm ends with the assurance that God will deliver and with the picture that deliverance only comes from God. Not only will God deliver, but that deliverance, when we're at rock bottom, only comes from God. That was true for David. That's true for us. David shares a very important truth here. We cannot wait until we are under attack to begin trusting God. But oftentimes, that's exactly what we do. We live in our own lives. God's out of the picture. Then when things get really bad, then we start seeking God. Then we start trying to trust God. And we have no foundation under us. And we struggle. We fail to recognize that those attacks are tests. They're testing to see what we already have. And to start trying to trust God when we're at the bottom... It's too late. It's like going in to take an exam, and when the exam is in front of you or in your middle of the test, you decide, well, now is the time to start studying. The test is there to determine what we already know. It seems like oftentimes the reason why we are at the bottom, the reason why these attacks are coming, is because we didn't study ahead of time. We were serving ourselves, and the choices that we made our lifestyle, our, our actions are what got us into that mess to begin with. David recognized we need to be growing in our relationship with God before the trial. We need to be trusting him before the trial in order to be able to grow through the trial and to be able to survive and come out of the other side of that trial strong and well and peaceful. The trials show the focus of our life. They show whether our focus is on us or on God. Oftentimes, we live life with a focus on us, and then the trials come and we try to change that focus to God, and it's only there until the trial leaves, and then we're back to what we were. And it's why we're constantly going back and forth. David made mistakes. He made big mistakes. But he got right with God. He admitted his sin to God. He submitted to God. He put God first in his life. And that is why in the worst situations, David could sleep. It's why in the worst situations, he had no fear. David's a reminder that you and I also can do the same if we put God first. That trusting God through everything so that we can trust him through the worst is the mark of a mature and growing Christian. Is that the mark of me and the mark of you 
Are we like David, able to go through the storms of life without fear, with peace? Because we have a foundation. That relationship with God is so deep and so strong because we have been exercising our faith all along. That we're able to go through those trials with peace and come out the other side knowing that God is as great as He says He is. Let's bow together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank You. Thank You for caring for each of us as much as You cared for David. Thank You, Lord, that even though we do things that are against you. You forgive us as quickly as you forgive David. Thank you, Lord, for being bigger than the problems that we face and being with us through those problems. Lord, help us. Help us to exercise our faith so that when those difficult times come, we are able to respond to them in the way David did and grow through those times, grow in our relationship with you, grow as people, and come out the other side strong, encouraged, excited about how you're going to use that to allow us to serve you better. In Jesus' name, amen.